Book two, chapter ten of Michael Strogoff by Jules Verne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter ten, Baikal and Angara. Lake Baikal is situated seventeen hundred feet above the level of the sea. Its length is about six hundred miles, its breadth seventy. Its depth is not known. Madame de Bourboulon states that, according to the boatmen, it likes to be spoken of as Madame C. If it is called Sir Lake, it immediately lashes itself into fury. However, it is reported and believed by the Siberians that a Russian is never drowned in it. The immense basin of fresh water, fed by more than three hundred rivers, is surrounded by magnificent volcanic mountains. It has no other outlet than the Angara, which, after passing Irkutsk, throws itself into the Yenisei, a little above the town of Yeniseisk. As to the mountains which encase it, they form a branch of the Tunguses, and are derived from the vast system of the Altai. In this territory, subject to peculiar climatical conditions, the autumn appears to be absorbed in the precocious winter. It was now the beginning of October, the sun set at five o'clock in the evening, and during the long nights the temperature fell to zero. The first snows, which would last till summer, already whitened the summits of the neighboring hills. During the Siberian winter, this inland sea is frozen over to the thickness of several feet, and is crossed by the sleighs of caravans. Either because there are people who are so wanting in politeness as to call it Sir Lake, or for some more meteorological reasons, Lake Baikal is subject to violent tempests. Its waves, short like those of all inland seas, are much feared by the rafts, trams, and steamboats which furrow it during the summer. It was the southwest point of the lake which Michael had now reached, carrying Nadia, whose whole life, so to speak, was concentrated into her eyes. But what could these two expect in this wild region if it was not to die of exhaustion and famine? And yet what remained of the long journey of four thousand miles for the Tsar's courier to reach his end? nothing but forty miles on the shore of the lake up to the mouth of the angara and sixty miles from the mouth of the angara to irkutsk in all a hundred miles or three days journey for a strong man even on foot could michael strogoff still be that man heaven no doubt did not wish to put him to this trial the fatality which had hitherto pursued his steps seemed for a time to spare him this end of the bicycle this part of the steppe which he believed to be a desert which it usually is was not so now about fifty people were collected at the angle formed by the end of the lake nadia immediately caught sight of this group when michael carrying her in his arms issued from the mountain pass the girl feared for a moment that it was a tartar detachment sent to beat the shores of the baikal in which case flight would have been impossible to them both but nadia was soon reassured Russians, she exclaimed, and with this last effort her eyes closed and her head fell on Michael's breast. But they had been seen, and some of these Russians, running to them, led the blind man and the girl to a little point at which was moored a raft. The raft was just going to start. These Russians were fugitives of different conditions, whom the same interest had united at Lake Baikal driven back by the tartar scouts they hoped to obtain a refuge at irkutsk but not being able to get there by land the invaders having occupied both banks of the angara they hoped to reach it by descending the river which flows through the town their plan made michael's heart leap a last chance was before him but he had strength to conceal this wishing to keep his incognito more strictly than ever the fugitive's plan was very simple a current in the lake runs along by the upper bank to the mouth of the angara this current they hoped to utilize and with its assistance to reach the outlet of lake baikal from this point to irkutsk the rapid waters of the river would bear them along at a rate of eight miles an hour in a day and a half they might hope to be in sight of the town no kind of boat was to be found they had been obliged to make one a raft or rather a float of wood similar to those which usually are drifted down siberian rivers was constructed 
a forest of firs growing on the bank had supplied the necessary materials the trunks fastened together with osiers made a platform on which a hundred people could have easily found room on board this raft michael and nadia were taken the girl had returned to herself some food was given to her as well as to her companion then lying on a bed of leaves she soon fell into a deep sleep to those who questioned him michael strogoff said nothing of what had taken place at tomsk he gave himself out as an inhabitant of krasnoyarsk who had not been able to get to irkutsk before the emir's troops arrived on the left bank of the dinka and he had added that very probably the bulk of the tartar forces had taken up a position before the siberian capital there was not a moment to be lost besides the cold was becoming more and more severe during the night the temperature fell below zero ice was already forming on the surface of the baikal although the raft managed to pass easily over the lake it might not be so easy between the banks of the angara should pieces of ice be found to block up its course at eight in the evening the moorings were cast off and the raft drifted in the current along the shore it was steered by means of long poles under the management of several muscular musics an old baikal boatman took command of the raft he was a man of sixty-five browned by the sun and lake breezes a thick white beard flowed over his chest a fur cap covered his head his aspect was grave and austere his large greatcoat fastened in at the waist reached down to his heels this taciturn old fellow was seated in the stern and issued his commands by gestures besides the chief work consisted in keeping the raft in the current which ran along the shore without drifting out into the open it has been already said that russians of all conditions had found place on the raft indeed to the poor muzhiks the women old men and children were joined two or three pilgrims surprised on their journey by the invasion a few monks and a priest the pilgrims carried a staff a gourd hung at the belt and they chanted psalms in a plaintive voice one came from the ukraine another from the yellow sea and a third from the finland provinces this last who was an aged man carried at his waist a little padlocked collecting box as if it had been hung at a church door of all that he collected during his long and fatiguing pilgrimage nothing was for himself he did not even possess the key of the box which would only be opened on his return the monks came from the north of the empire three months before they had left the town of archangel they had visited the sacred islands near the coast of karelia the convent of solovetsk the convent of troitsa those of saint antony and saint theodosia at kiev that of kazan as well as the church of the old believers and they were now on their road to irkutsk wearing the robe the cowl and the clothes of serge as to the papa or priest he was a plain village pastor one of the six hundred thousand popular pastors which the russian empire contains he was clothed as miserably as the muzhiks not being above them in the social position in fact laboring like a peasant on his plot of the ground baptizing marrying burying he had been able to protect his wife and children from the brutality of the tartars by sending them away into the northern provinces he himself had stayed in his parish up to the last moment then he was obliged to fly and the irkutsk road being stopped had come to the lake baikal these priests grouped in the forward part of the raft prayed at regular intervals raising their voices in the silent night and at the end of each sentence of their prayer the slava bogu glory to god issued from their lips no incident took place during the night nadia remained in a sort of stupor and michael watched beside her sleep only overtook him at long intervals and even then his brain did not rest at the break of day the raft delayed by a strong breeze which counteracted the course of the current was still forty versts from the mouth of the angara it seemed probable that the fugitives could not reach it before three or four o'clock in the evening this did not trouble them on the contrary for they would then descend the river during the night and the darkness would also favor their entrance into irkutsk the only anxiety exhibited at times by the old boatman was concerning the formation of ice on the surface of the water the night had been excessively cold 
pieces of ice could be seen drifting towards the west. Nothing was to be dreaded from these, since they could not drift into the Angara, having already passed the mouth, but pieces from the eastern end of the lake might be drawn by the current between the banks of the river. This would cause difficulty, possibly delay, and perhaps even an insurmountable obstacle which would stop the raft. Michael, therefore, took immense interest in ascertaining what was the state of the lake, and whether any large number of the ice blocks appeared. Nadia being now awake, he questioned her often, and she gave him an account of all that was going on. Whilst the blocks were thus drifting, curious phenomena were taking place on the surface of the Baikal. Magnificent jets from springs of boiling water shot up from some of those artesian wells which nature had bored in the very bed of the lake. These jets rose to a great height and spread out in vapor, which was illuminated by the solar rays and almost immediately condensed by the cold. This curious sight would have assuredly amazed a tourist travelling in peaceful times on this Siberian sea. At four in the evening, the mouth of the Angara was signalled by the old boatman between the high granite rocks of the shore. On the right bank could be seen the little port of Livenichnaya, its church and its few houses built on the bank. But the serious thing was that the ice blocks from the east were already drifting between the banks of the Angara and consequently were descending towards Irkutsk. However, their number was not yet great enough to obstruct the course of the raft, nor the cold great enough to increase their number. The raft arrived at the little port and there stopped. The old boatman wished to put into harbour for an hour, in order to make some repairs. The trunks threatened to separate, and it was important to fasten them more securely together to resist the rapid current of the Angara. The old boatman did not expect to receive any fresh fugitives at Livenichnaya, and yet the moment the raft touched, two passengers issuing from a deserted house ran as fast as they could towards the beach. Nadia, seated on the raft, was abstractedly gazing at the shore. A cry was about to escape her. She seized Michael's hand, who at that moment raised his head. "'What is the matter, Nadia?' he asked. "'Are two travelling companions, Michael?' the frenchman and the englishman whom we met in the defiles of the ural yes michael started for the strict incognito which he wished to keep ran a risk of being betrayed indeed it was no longer as nicolas korpanov that jolivet and blount would now see him but as the true michael strogoff courier of the czar the two correspondents had already met him twice since their separation at the ichim post house the first time at the zabediero camp when he laid open Ivan Ogaryev's face with the knout, the second time at Tomsk, when he was condemned by the emir. They therefore knew who he was, and what depended on him. Michael Strogoff rapidly made up his mind. Nadia, said he, when they step on board, ask them to come to me. It was, in fact, Blount and Jolivet whom the course of events had brought to the port of Livenichnaya, as it had brought Michael Strogoff. As we know, after having been present at the entry of the Tartars into Tomsk, they had departed before the savage execution which terminated the fate. They had therefore never suspected that their former travelling companion had not been put to death, but blinded by order of the emir. Having procured horses, they had left Tomsk the same evening, with the fixed determination of henceforward dating their letters from the Russian camp of eastern Siberia. They proceeded by forced marches towards Irkutsk. They hoped to distance Fiofar Khan, and would certainly have done so had it not been for the unexpected apparition of the third column, come from the south, up the valley of the Yenisei. They had been cut off, as had been Michael, before being able even to reach the Dinka, and had been obliged to go back to Lake Baikal. They had been in the place for three days in much perplexity when the raft arrived. The fugitive's plan was explained to them. There was certainly a chance that they might be able to pass under cover of the night and penetrate into Irkutsk. They resolved to make the attempt. Alcide directly communicated with the old boatman and asked a passage for himself and his companion, offering to pay anything he demanded, whatever it might be. No one pays here, replied the old man gravely. Everyone risks his life. That is all. The two correspondents came on board, and Nadia saw them take their places in the forepart of the raft. Harry Blount was still the reserved Englishman who had scarcely addressed a word to her during the whole passage over the Ural Mountains. 
Alcide Jolivet seemed to be rather more grave than usual, and it may be acknowledged that his gravity was justified by the circumstances. Jolivet had, as has been said, taken his seat on the raft when he felt a hand laid on his arm. Turning, he recognized Nadia, the sister of the man who was no longer Nicolas Korpanov, but Michael Strogoff, courier of the Tsar. He was about to make an exclamation of surprise when he saw the young girl lay her finger on her lips. Come, said Nadia, and with a careless air, Alcide rose and followed her, making a sign to Blount to accompany him. But if the surprise of the correspondents had been great at meeting Nadia on the raft, it was boundless when they perceived Michael Strogoff, whom they had believed to be no longer living. Michael had not moved at their approach. Jolivet turned towards the girl. He does not see you, gentlemen, said Nadia. The Tartars have burnt out his eyes. My poor brother is blind. A feeling of lively compassion exhibited itself on the faces of Blount and his companion. In a moment they were seated beside Michael, pressing his hand and waiting until he spoke to them. Gentlemen, said Michael in a low voice, you ought not to know who I am, nor what I am come to do in Siberia. I ask you to keep my secret. Will you promise me to do so? On my honor, answered Jolivet. On my word as a gentleman, added Blount. Good, gentlemen. Can we be of any use to you? asked Harry Blount. Could we not help you to accomplish your task? I prefer to act alone, replied Michael. But those blackguards have destroyed your sight, said Alcide. I have Nadia, and her eyes are enough for me. In half an hour the raft left the little port of Livenichnaya and entered the river. It was five in the evening and getting dusk. The night promised to be dark and very cold also, for the temperature was already below zero. Alcide and Blount, though they had promised to keep Michael's secret, did not leave him. They talked in a low voice, and the blind man, adding what they told him to what he already knew, was able to form an exact idea of the state of things. It was certain that the Tartars had actually invested Irkutsk, and that the three columns had effected a junction. There was no doubt that the Emir and Ivan Ogaryev were before the capital. But why did the Tsar's courier exhibit such haste to get there, now that the imperial letter could no longer be given by him to the Grand Duke, and when he did not even know the contents of it? Alcide Jolivet and Blount could not understand it any more than Nadia had done. No one spoke of the past, except when Jolivet thought it his duty to say to Michael, We owe you some apology for not shaking hands with you when we separated at Ishim. No, you had reason to think me a coward. At any rate, added the Frenchman, you know the face of that villain finally, and he will carry the mark of it for a long time. No, not a long time, replied Michael quietly. Half an hour after leaving Livenichnaya, Blount and his companion were acquainted with the cruel trials through which Michael and his companion had successively passed. They could not but heartily admire his energy, which was only equalled by the young girl's devotion. Their opinion of Michael was exactly what the Tsar had expressed at Moscow. Indeed, this is a man. The raft swiftly threaded its way among the blocks of ice which were carried along in the current of the Angara. A moving panorama was displayed on both sides of the river, and, by the optical illusion, it appeared as if it was the raft which was motionless before a succession of picturesque scenes. Here were high granite cliffs there wide gorges down which rushed the current sometimes appeared a clearing with a still smoking village then thick pine forests blazing but though the tartars had left their traces on all sides they themselves were not to be seen as yet for they were more especially massed at the approaches to irkutsk all this time the pilgrims were repeating their prayers aloud and the old boatmen shoving away the blocks of ice which pressed too near them imperturbably steered the raft in the middle of the rapid current of the Angara. End of chapter 10